Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and today we're diving into the topic of wars in Victoria 3. War is a very tricky beast in Vicky 3, even by the standard of Paradox games, and though it is possible to play a run without declaring a single war, chances are you might occasionally want to pull out the old Enfield and take a shot or two. Today we'll discuss not just the process of fighting a war, but the lead up to war and the reasons to go to war in the first place too. More in-depth guides focused on other topics are coming soon as well, so don't hesitate to subscribe if you're interested in more, and if you have any specific topics you want to see explored and explained, let me know in the comments down below. But for the time being, there is no more time to waste on an introduction. So with timestamps down below, let's begin. Diplomatic Plays Explained War. What is it good for? Quite a bit actually, though in an ideal world, the threat of war is enough to get you what you want without a drop of blood being spilled. Before we talk about how you can pull that off though, let's talk about the various reasons you might have to put it all on the line in the first place. Diplomatic plays are any kind of demand your nation might make of another that you're willing to use force to make happen. Sometimes you can opt for a peaceful approach, like choosing to demand independence rather than making a diplomatic play for it. Whereas a diplomatic action relies on relations, power projection, ideological differences, and a base reluctance, a diplomatic play relies on a show of force to get what either side wants at the cost of increased infamy, calling in allies and favors to apply pressure and, if need be, enforce the demand or shut it down with the help of ample gunpowder. Diplomatic plays then replace the casus belli of other paradox games, acting as the reasons to go to war. There are many diplomatic plays available to different nations based on their circumstances. We'll go over the most common in just a moment, but note that a puppet or vassal nation is unable to make any diplomatic plays apart from an independence play against their overlord, and that lower rank nations don't have access to certain plays either, and some plays are exclusively available to certain nations, certain regions, or certain cultures. Note also that you can only make diplomatic plays against nations that are in strategic regions where you have an interest. The strategic regions map mode reveals all said regions, and your nation will automatically have a natural interest in any region that it holds even the tiniest bit of territory in, including puppet nations. To make diplomatic plays against nations beyond that, you need to have a declared interest if they fall in a different strategic region to one you hold territory in. The maximum number of declared interests you can have is determined by your country rank and by the productivity of your naval bases, with each naval base adding more possible declared interests depending on their output. You can always cancel existing interests in order to declare new ones, but keep in mind that it takes some time for cancellations and declarations to take hold, and that interests are also integral to trade and diplomacy as we discussed in our previous video. One more thing to keep in mind is that you can only declare interests in strategic regions you can actually reach. They must either neighbor one of your natural interests, that is, strategic regions you hold at least a little territory in, or both the targeted region and your nation must have a coastal state with a port in it, allowing you to reach each other by sea. Once you've declared an interest in a region, you'll be able to make plays against nations within that region if applicable. The humiliation diplomatic play can only be used to target a rival nation, so make sure to declare a rivalry with them first. A victory here means the humiliated party is not allowed to oppose the victor in any diplomatic plays for five years, potentially removing them as a potential enemy in diplomatic plays that you'd rather not have them involved in. Humiliation also reduces the prestige of the targeted nation for the same duration, potentially dropping their nation's rank as a result, temporarily forcing them to adjust accordingly. The open market diplomatic play is used to force a nation to adopt free trade policies in place of whatever they currently have. In the case of a formerly isolationist nation, this makes them a viable target for import and export trade routes, giving the world access to previously unavailable pops to sell goods to, and a brand new market to import goods from as well. That's not all though. Free trade policies prevent the targeted nation from applying tariffs, making it more profitable for trade centers to trade with them, and it also increases the amount of goods flowing in and out of the nation in question. Another commerce center diplomatic play is Take Treaty Port. Victory here grants the aggressor a coastal province in the targeted state, automatically building a port in said province if one did not already exist. And if you have market access with a province that is acting as the treaty port, the defeated nation will not be able to apply an embargo on you, nor will they be able to apply tariffs to goods you're trading with them. This applies exclusively to you as the holder of the treaty port, and it saves your trade centers plenty of money as any goods you're now importing or exporting with that target market is no longer having to pay tariffs to both sides of the agreement. The tariffs being paid to your government still apply, but there are no tariffs being paid to the other end, the defeated nation. 
Naturally, this means you're able to make money from the tariff still, while the defeated nation no longer has that source of revenue. Beyond that, it acts as a coastal access point, meaning it allows previously landlocked countries to now declare interests in and trade with nations in new strategic regions that were previously out of reach by land routes. Finally, the new treaty port is also considered territory within the strategic region it's in, which means the strategic region becomes a natural interest if it was previously a declared interest instead. This gives trade partner options in the strategic region and more targets for diplomatic plays in the strategic region as well, while freeing up another interest to declare. This is why it's important to make sure you pick the right location for the treaty port you're asking for. You want to maximize your gains by obtaining a natural interest in a new strategic region and potentially further spreading your influence in the new region as well. You can expect trade centers to crop up in treaty port states, and so you can expect a degree of migration as new job opportunities open up too. These treaty ports can be used as launch pads for future naval invasions and can station troops for further land advances as well. For all intents and purposes, it's land that is entirely under your jurisdiction, but they cannot be incorporated, people living there have less political power, they cannot vote, they do not receive the effects of active institutions, they do not pay taxes, and the province itself has a reduced maximum infrastructure and battalion count. You should also note that you can take away a treaty port from another nation by making a diplomatic play for it. Next, there are three common kinds of subjugation diplomatic plays. Make Puppet, Make Vassal, and Make Dominion. Though each result in the target of a successful play becoming the subject of the one making the play, there are slight differences with regards to the levels of autonomy and how much money the subject owes their overlord. They all also result in the subject joining their overlord's market. Using these approaches is a great way to make a lot of money especially under the economic circumstances some of these plays put the targeted nation in. Then there are a few diplomatic plays involving subjects. Transfer subject asks the targeted nation to transfer one of their subjects to the aggressor, while liberate subject asks the targeted nation to simply grant them independence. Independence plays are done by the subject themselves to try and obtain that very same liberation and can only be between a subject and their overlord, though outside intervention is likely, as we'll discuss in a moment. Conquer state is the diplomatic play one needs to make in order to take territory from the target, while return state is specifically about taking back what was previously taken away. Any nation with slavery abolished as per their laws and policies can also force a target nation to do the same, potentially damaging their economy as buildings that once profited off the backs of free labor now have to pay wages. It can also cause a fair bit of turmoil as former slaves don't typically start their emancipated lives with an acceptable standard of living. This diplomatic play might be ideological in name, but it certainly has political and economic impacts too. On the topic of which, the regime change can force a nation to adopt ideals and a system of government more akin to yours, while force recognition is the diplomatic play a strong but unrecognized power needs to do in order to become recognized and gain access to higher ranks and their associated benefits. There are a few more diplomatic plays that are fairly self-explanatory, but also rarer to come by. In the interest of not spoiling things, I'll trust the rest of this section makes it easy to interpret those rare ones when they come your way. Now, regardless of which diplomatic play you decide to make and why, what follows is the unfolding of the play itself. The Phases and Escalation to War There are three phases that precede open hostilities, but just because the fighting hasn't started doesn't mean there's nothing for you to concern yourself with. The Diplomatic Play screen shares a lot of information that'll help you assess not just the preparedness for war on either side, but also the likelihood of it. You can see which countries share an interest in the region of the Diplomatic Play, and you can see if any of those nations are currently leaning one way or another, or if any of those nations will be willing to join your side when the next phase starts. You cannot try to sway them until the second phase, but you can start making plans accordingly. The first of the three phases is called opening moves, and during this phase you can see how many troops are likely to join on either side, and if they've already started to mobilize. You can also see how many maneuvers either side has on hand. These are political maneuvers, determined by the nation's rank, and used to add more war goals or sway nations to one side. You can also see if nations are supporting either side as a result of pre-existing treaties, and you can add more war goals to the war, basically creating a combination of diplomatic plays in one. Note that each war goal makes peace harder to achieve, and each added war goal costs some maneuvers, while some can also add to your nation's infamy, a very important stat worth keeping an eye on as it makes you more of a villain in the world's eyes, increasing radicalization in conquered territories, 
and making you more enemies, while also opening you up to the cut down to size diplomatic play when you reach 100 infamy. Another important factor here that remains relevant until the fighting begins is the target's confidence. This is a representation of how the target feels about their chances, and if it's particularly low, they might simply back down from the play and capitulate before it escalates into war. Confidence is determined by comparing military strength with things like gold reserves and loyalists helping bolster confidence with issues like turmoil reducing it. Note that mobilizing troops has an impact on confidence too, but be careful about mobilizing your troops too early. You cannot demobilize them until the diplomatic play or subsequent war comes to an end, and it's extremely expensive to maintain mobilized troops compared to those that are not. Keep barracks input goods as cheap as possible, ensure you have a decent gold reserve, and make sure you don't go bankrupt before the fighting even starts, but you also want to make sure you're not caught with your pants down, mobilizing troops too late, waiting for them to gear up while your enemy is ravaging your lands. The time it takes for a battalion to mobilize is determined by the infrastructure of that state, which is a good reason to stay on top of that. But make sure you also start to actually move the troops where you'll need them. Having them be mobilized but sitting on the wrong side of the country won't do you much good if fighting actually breaks out, and traveling takes time, especially traveling overseas. If you're lucky, your target backs down because their confidence is too low. Otherwise, things escalate to the next phase, diplomatic maneuvers. While either side can still back down at this point in time, you're quickly hurling towards open conflict. In this phase, you can use your leftover maneuvers to keep adding more war goals or to sway other interested nations into joining you. Nations aren't always willing to join in on a diplomatic play on either side, and even if they are, it usually comes with some aspirations of their own. If you're able to sway a nation, you'll see the green thumbs up, and clicking through reveals what you can offer them to bring them in. Again, be warned, any war goals you add here will make obtaining peace just a little bit harder, so don't overdo it just to sway nations. Any swayed nation joins peace deal negotiations and can prevent them from going through if their own demands aren't being met, so pick your partners wisely. Note that the likelihood of swaying a nation to your side is dependent on a few things. Their opinions of and relations with either nation involved in the diplomatic play is one thing, as are the ideological similarities that make a difference too all further modified by sympathy towards either side and either side's power projection. The target of a diplomatic play tends to have more sympathy among other nations, and the less infamous nation tends to have more sympathy too. Nations are more willing to join nations that they're sympathetic to, so try not to be too infamous lest you find yourself alone during diplomatic plays, particularly those targeting you. Nations involved in another diplomatic play are unlikely to join a new one, and nations that have a truce with either side cannot join the diplomatic play against that side. Keep these in mind when starting a diplomatic play, as it's a good way to avoid a potentially large enemy if they're otherwise preoccupied, or if you have a truce. Note also that if there are two nations up for swaying that are enemies, bringing one to your side might convince the other to join the opposition, purely to posture against their rival. Make sure you've done all your swaying and adding of war goals before the third and final phase, the countdown to war. This is more of an idle phase, finishing off the mobilization of battalions and flotillas alike, though it's not too late for either side to back down until war finally begins. Once war has begun, war support is the key stat that keeps it going. Once it's low enough on one side, the other is able to enforce its demands, but how low this war support actually needs to be depends on which war goals are being pushed as part of the peace deal. Sometimes you can give the defeated side a consolation prize in order to reduce how low you need to push their war support. After all, a prolonged war is an expensive war. War support ticks once a week by a value determined by percentage of territory occupied, percentage of population radicalized, casualties taken, events, and a base decay rate. This means that it's harder to make a larger nation lose war support as it takes longer to occupy a larger percentage of their territory. And it also means you'll want to keep your own population happy on the lead-up to and during war, as radicalization can be a huge hit to war support. Similarly, if you can find a way to cause unrest in enemy territory, you should do so. We'll discuss how to cut off their supplies for goods and hurt their population's wealth and standard of living later on in this video, as economic warfare is a very powerful tool. Once all those factors chip away at all negotiating parties' appetite for war by enough, you'll be able to offer a peace deal in accordance to your war goals. Or, you can wait until the war support reaches negative 100 for nations on the other side of the war to force them to capitulate entirely. Keep in mind, war support will not go below zero if you do not hold an enemy nation's capital and if you do not hold the war goals. 
Note that you can sometimes get away without giving your swayed nations what they joined in for. This relies heavily on their war support being low or being quickly chipped away. Ultimately, peace is brokered and the aftermaths must be dealt with. But before we get there, let's discuss fielding, equipping, and affording an army. Battalions and flotillas make up your army and navy, with recruited generals and admirals leading them in a variety of actions during war, providing them with buffs, debuffs, and modifiers in accordance with their traits. Using the military map mode, you can quickly see where you have these battalions and flotillas organized by strategic regions rather than individual states. Barracks spread across the states of a single strategic region add battalions at the strategic region's HQ, even if they're spread across island chains, and naval bases spread across states of a strategic region give access to flotillas in said HQ too. The size of the barracks or naval base determines how many battalions or flotillas it provides respectively, and while local battalions join in the defense of the state they're in, they need to be assigned a general in order to move anywhere, defend a different province, or attack. Flotillas need admirals to perform actions too, and if you're launching a naval invasion, you need to have your flotillas and your battalions at the same HQ. They cannot be from two different HQs. Barracks and naval bases are like any other building, needing employees and goods, but their production method changes take some time to take effect, giving a temporary debuff to your armies. When in place, they can make a huge difference to the battlefield efficiency and power projection of the battalions the barracks provides. Increased kill rates means a smaller army can whittle down a larger one with ease. Increased morale damage means an army can force an enemy surrender more quickly. A higher training rate means weakened battalions can be brought up to full strength more quickly. And increased offense and defense stats make a battalion better at said task. To that end, you'll notice some production methods make for better attackers, while others make for better defenders. It's not a bad idea to specialize your barracks and assign your battalion's tasks accordingly during war. To stay organized, you can adjust production methods through the military tab on a per general or per admiral basis. Offense and defense ratings are pit against each other during battles, with the relevant rating being used if the battalion is attacking or defending, and morale damage and kill rates both determine how quickly your battalions can overcome the enemy by either depleting their will to fight or their ability. Kill rate is directly opposed to recovery rates. The difference between the two determine how many soldiers wounded in a battle die and how many are able to recover either to return to the fray right away, to prolong the battle they're in, or to return home as dependents. Some production methods cause more devastation wherever they fight, causing long-term damage that we'll discuss in a bit, and other production methods modify the province's captured and province's lost values, another thing we'll discuss in just a little bit. Naval bases and their production methods are focused primarily on the offense and defense stats for their flotillas, where they also make a huge difference to naval power projection, and they have modifiers to morale damage output and protection, as well as better ways to strike at enemy shipping and supply lanes. You'll notice that you don't always want the highest level of production method across either building type, instead pursuing the stat adjustments that best suit your strategies and the types of equipment you can actually provide your troops. Make sure you have access to the needed goods, as the price of the equipment listed here for barracks and naval bases alike will come right from your treasury, and if your supply of these goods is severely lacking, you'll see penalties to your army's stats and resulting performance on the battlefield. To help ease the pain of cost, you can adjust your budget at the risk of upsetting the armed forces or seek increased production and trade for these goods. Apart from your professional army raised from barracks, you can use conscription centers to arm your pops and send them to war too. This can really bolster your numbers on the battlefield, but any conscripted pops will have to abandon their jobs and, as a result, they'll stop contributing to your economy. It also puts them at risk of death or returning as dependents who no longer make a full wage, so conscription is not a decision to be made lightly. You can choose which states to activate conscription centers at individually, and it's not a bad idea to pick the least productive states to minimize the impact to your economy. You can also use conscription centers to indirectly pick and choose who goes to fight and potentially die for your nation. In some cases, this can be used to further internal goals beyond the current war. And, as with barracks and naval bases, conscription centers have varied production methods you can use too. Either way, as mentioned previously, if you want your battalions and flotillas to do more than defend where they stand, you'll need to recruit generals and admirals respectively. They're able to lead a number of units determined by their rank, so feel free to promote them as needed, or recruit multiple generals and admirals for an HQ that has a particularly high concentration of troops. And with the generals and admirals rearing to go, it's time to discuss fronts, battles, and naval support. Rather than micromanage individual armies around the world going from state to state, 
Victoria III breaks the lines of engagement between national borders into fronts. These fronts can either be expansive or tiny, depending entirely on the length of the border and the terrain in the region. And as armies fight on the front, it moves backwards and forwards as provinces are gained and lost through battle. Mobilized generals can be told to move to a front to either advance it or defend it, telling them to take provinces and move into enemy territory or hold the line respectively. Once assigned to a front, it takes some time to actually arrive at it, and as long as a general isn't engaged in battle, you can give them new orders. Often, you'll need to bring battalions in from overseas. If there's an unoccupied friendly territory or occupied enemy territory adjacent to the front you intend to station the general at, your general and his battalions can travel using convoys both during war and before it's broken out during the diplomatic phases. But if there's no adjacent unoccupied friendly territory or occupied enemy territory for them to land at, there's technically no front on land, so you need to order an amphibious assault with the help of a naval force. This can only be done once a war has broken out, and in order to do so, you need a flotilla with an admiral recruited at the same HQ as your general and his army, and then you need to tell the admiral to lead a naval invasion at the front where you want the troops, assigning the specific general that needs to move with the admiral. Note that it doesn't matter where the general and his army or the admiral and his ships are currently stationed. They need to originate from naval bases and barracks in the same HQ when you first acquired them, not where they're currently located. To clarify, you do not need to bring them back to their home HQ to deploy them to the new location, but they just need to be from the same original HQ before you started moving troops around. Be warned, it takes a very long time, even over short distances, but once you've had a successful naval invasion create a beachhead, you can use convoys to move troops to the newly created front instead, no longer needing flotillas and naval invasions in the region, bringing your ships up for other duties. When fighting overseas, troops stay supplied with the help of convoys traveling over shipping lanes. These convoys are temporarily in use by the army until the associated front is dealt with, even if it's adjacent to occupied territory, so make sure you have spare convoys on hand for when needed. Don't hesitate to use your admirals to escort convoys to keep your shipping lanes fully operational, or perhaps raid convoys to damage enemy shipping lanes, hurting not just their ability to supply their armies, but also their trade routes moving along the same shipping lanes, impacting their markets, and potentially causing reduced standard of living as a result of increased prices, bringing forth some radicalization to help deteriorate their war support. Clicking on a C node will show you which nations are using it for what trade routes, and Keep in mind, you can only target the shipping lanes of people you're at war with. Once you find a suitable target, simply tell an admiral to raid convoys at that sea node and watch as enemy ships are sunk over time and the movement of goods slowed. Again, this can cause radicalization and turmoil if cutting off essential supplies and hurting standard of living, or as mentioned before, it can cause issues with military capabilities if you're cutting off military supplies instead. Separately. Your admirals can also be told to patrol coasts to destroy enemy flotillas and reduce their ability to cause you harm or defend their own shipping lanes. Back from the seas to the fronts, though. Whether coming from overseas or from down the street, you can see how many battalions either side has at a front, as well as how many are en route, and the number in the middle will let you know if the odds favor you or the enemy. The bar filling up represents a general order to advance, making moves on either side to engage in an advancing battle, eventually doing so when the bar fills up. Multiple generals can arrive at a front with different orders, and they'll behave accordingly, but note that the total number of battalions at a front will pretty much never engage in a single battle all at once, outside of when numbers are extremely small. This is because those battalions are actually spread out across the entire length of the front, and they'll participate in multiple smaller battles at a time in smaller groups, advancing or defending the front in multiple locations. The number of battalions brought to a battle by either side from my investigation so far is determined by a multitude of factors that represent the general's decision-making and the front itself. Some fronts can only sustain a limited number of battalions in battle at a time, while some battles have the number partly determined by the state's infrastructure and the battlefield terrain's combat with limitations. Generals with the defend order will add more battalions to counter higher stats on the other side of the battlefield, but Keep in mind, there's a difference between a general who's been ordered to advance and finds himself defending, compared to a general who's been ordered to defend. The calculation only applies to the latter. Don't underestimate the value of ordering a general to defend a front. Bringing more troops to a battle is a great way to neutralize other statistical advantages the enemy might have. An advancing general does something similar when attacking, 
adding more troops to counter higher stats on the other side of the battlefield, but they do so to a much lesser degree than a general ordered to defend a front. This means when a general ordered to advance with higher quality troops faces an enemy general who has also been ordered to advance but with lower quality troops, they will typically find themselves outnumbered since the general with the weaker troops will bring more of them while the general with the stronger troops will not add troops to whatever baseline calculation they have done. After all these baseline calculations though, there is one more to be done to get the final battalion number. Generals ordered to advance have their battalion count reduced by up to 66%, while generals ordered to defend have their battalion count reduced by up to 50%. The amount of this reduction is random, but as you can see, an advancing general can have significantly worse outcomes than a defending general. It's worth noting that not all battalions are equal in number. A full strength battalion might be a thousand troops, but after a few battles, a battalion might quickly be a fraction of that, and so they might be more quickly wiped out despite appearing equally numerically strong at first glance. If you're wondering why you're losing battles even with the same or higher number of battalions as the enemy, the answer is most likely in the details. Don't hesitate to pull a general away from the fronts to tell them to stand by and allow them to replenish their battalions without taking constant losses. This will send them back to their HQ and yes, this can take a very long time, especially if their HQ is far away, but sometimes it's your only real option. At other times, you might be able to order a general to move to a front that lacks any fighting. If they're told to defend a quiet front, they should be safe from any battles, allowing them to replenish their troops while also being closer to the front they'll eventually need to return to, reducing their travel time significantly. Keep an eye on the enemy making similar moves, or rather, keep an eye on them not making similar moves. There's something to be said for defending a front and allowing your enemy to take significant losses as they keep trying to break through against your defensive positions and then eventually turning around and advancing that same front before the enemy has had a chance to replenish numbers or recover from the morale loss. This can lead to a string of victories and a great gain of momentum. Keep in mind though, the number of soldiers is not all that matters, especially in an era where technological superiority changed the battlefield forever. Numbers aside, the specific battalions brought into a single battle are determined by the generals at the front, sometimes including battalions borrowed from other generals at the same front. Note that borrowed battalions do not get the benefits of the general they are normally commanded by if they have been borrowed by somebody else. Note also that each battalion has their own stats based on the production methods of the barracks where they originated from, impacting the overall army offense and defense capabilities. Only one is used in battle, depending on if the army is the attacker or defender, but either way, these numbers are a calculation of the average stat across all of your units, rounded up, with modifiers added based on the general's traits, whether a naval invasion has brought enough ships, and the randomized battlefield condition. This randomized battlefield condition is determined at the start of a battle by a dice roll influenced by the general's traits and the current orders. An attacking army is not likely to be dug in, for example, and the terrain itself is largely determined by where in the world the front actually is and where along that front the battle is taking place. From what I've seen, this location is determined somewhat randomly along the front with a multitude of calculations influencing your general's decision behind the scenes. From my understanding so far, for example, a battle location that would advance the front towards a war goal tends to be weighted more heavily, as does an attack on a capital state. As your general weighs these decisions though, you should note that the terrain is a potential source of buffs and debuffs, based on the battling general's capabilities, and terrain determines combat width too. Even though the actual number for combat width is hidden, it does determine how well a smaller force can hold off a larger force. Use your eyes to determine what kind of terrain is most likely to serve as the battlefield along a front. A front that is entirely flat will feature only plains, whereas a front along a mountain range will feature mountainous terrain, and a front along a forest will feature forest terrain. I think that makes sense. Use that information then to pick and choose which general you send based on any relevant traits they might have, though keep in mind that most fronts will be a mix of terrain types across multiple battles. As a battle goes on, soldiers will either die or end up wounded, and as these casualties pile up, battalions will lose morale until it crosses a threshold and they retreat, if they haven't been completely killed off. Note that individual battalions are tracked as separate entities, so they will fight and die and retreat separate from each other, though obviously, the loss of one will impact the battle as a whole. To ensure soldiers are recovering from their injuries, you'll want to have higher recovery rates as primarily determined by the barracks production methods, and to ensure they're able to maintain their morale, you need to keep them well supplied which, again, when overseas, uses convoys until the front has been taken care of. 
Recovery from wounds can happen mid-battle, and those troops rejoining as reinforcements can tip a battle one way or another. Morale, however, takes a lot of time to replenish, and it's only replenished to a maximum number equal to supply. So, if supply is reduced, that means morale can't max out either, which means your battalions are quicker to surrender in battle and hand you the defeat. Naturally, that's a good reason to try and cut off enemy supply routes too. You can see a breakdown of exactly what effects are impacting the soldiers on either side, and you can see the culture of the dead and wounded too. That can have quite an impact on demographics back home, or at colonies from which your armies may have been raised, if you consider that to be a primary concern. When a battle finally comes to an end, provinces are captured in accordance to the general and their advance or defense orders, as well as any modifiers resulting from production methods associated with the involved battalions and their barracks. The scope of the victory also determines how many provinces are gained, with more decisive victories granting greater gains. Advancing generals push into enemy territory when they win, with the defeat maintaining the front line as is, while defending generals reclaim lost territory and try to hold the line as best as possible. Do not underestimate the value of defense. Captured war goals, casualties, and occupation all play a key role in causing war exhaustion, ultimately leading to peace negotiations as discussed in the previous section. But the effects of war linger. The Aftermath of War a truce between warring nations prevents renewed hostilities for at least a handful of years. It also prevents those nations from joining diplomatic plays against one another, and it's a potentially good way to control the scale of future wars. But while there is a time of peace between these involved nations, and while barracks make up for employees that they lost during the war, replenishing weakened battalions to full strength, the rest of the nation must struggle with the worst parts of the aftermath. Soldiers that return maimed will typically become dependents, making less money than they previously did, potentially hurting the wealth level of their pop group and hurting the nation as a whole as a result. Reduced wealth levels, after all, cause reduced standard of living, which can cause radicalization and potential trouble on the horizon. Beyond the people, the land itself suffers. Devastation in a state is the result of battles and occupation, accumulating over time the longer the specific state is suffering under those two elements. The more battles happening in a state result in higher devastation, and the longer it remains occupied before a peace deal is struck, the higher it goes on a daily basis too. The battalions involved in battles in the state have a major impact on battle-related devastation as well. The production methods of their home barracks might encourage more devastation, such as in the case of chemical weapon specialists and flamethrower companies. Whatever the case may be, only after a peace does devastation start to slowly reduce, but until it does, the state suffers from reduced infrastructure, throughput, and migration attraction, as well as increased mortality. The state's economy suffers greatly as a result, which can lead to rampant poverty and emigration, ultimately hurting your nation, especially in the case of production hubs and economic centers. You want to keep the fighting away from these locations as best as possible, or at least keep them to a minimum for yourself, as the slow rate of decay means accumulated devastation can take a very long time to remove. And even then, for the most hotly contested regions, it's only a matter of time before the cracking of gunfire drowns out all else once more. I hope this video gave you some insight into how war works in Victoria 3. The game asks you to delegate the finer military matters to your generals as you busy yourself with keeping them armed, fed, and fighting fit. It's a very unique approach to war, and so I felt this deep dive was needed. If this video helped, consider hitting that like button, and feel free to ask questions in the comments down below or in the Discord channel I've linked in the description as well, and I'll answer all that I can. For more Vicky3 guides, tips, let's plays, and more, don't hesitate to subscribe. And as always, a massive thanks goes out to all of the channel members and patrons who've been supporting the channel on a monthly basis. They'll keep us alive and running smoothly. And of course, a big old thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time, cheers.